man is driving down the road a little bit faster than he should. And uh, he gets pulled over by the police. And the sheriff's uh, deputy, he comes up to the window and he said, you're going a little bit fast there, weren't you? And said, uh, you know, you got something you need to tell me? The man says, oh, nothing other than the fact that I have an AK, might have an AK-47 in my trunk. He said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, anything else you want to tell me? Oh, well, I might have a dead body back there. So then the deputy starts to get excited. And uh, he says, I think I'm going to have to get a little help here. So you just stay right there, and I'm going to call the sheriff, and he's going to come talk to you. So the sheriff comes along, and uh, he comes up to the guy, and he says, so I hear you have an AK-47 in your trunk. No, I don't have an AK-47 in my trunk, not at all. Says, well, my deputy said you uh, have a dead body back in your trunk. No, no, I don't have a dead body back in my trunk. Said, we'll go back there and look. And he gets out his key and he goes back and opens up the trunk. Sure enough, nothing back there. So he said, well, I don't understand. Said, my deputy said that you had an AK-47 and a dead body in your trunk. So the man says, well, that lying thing, he probably told you I was speeding too. <laughs> you probably heard about the big lie. And first of all, I want to say that I'm not a preacher. And, uh, you know, this old body, it's God where it don't do a lot of things that it used to could. But, uh, you know, I never worry about somebody coming and ask me to preach or to, uh, to teach a class or anything like that. It just, I dread the day when they say, when they don't come and do that. But I do appreciate being asked. Um, but you've heard about the big lie. And that's what I'm going to talk to you uh, tonight about. And what's interesting about it is you have one side that's saying, oh, you're telling a big lie about one thing. And then a little bit later on, the other side, they're saying, you're telling a big lie. Now, I'm going to let you process when one politician points at another and say, you're telling a big lie. I'm going to let you think about that. But that's not really the big lie that we as Christians know about. I'm going to talk to you tonight about four things so that you'll know when I'm about done. Then I'll have my little diatrophy at the end. But um, I'm going to talk about sin is good. Also, I am going to talk about what people think is beautiful. And then also, I am going to talk about, we think material things are going to make us happy. And then I'm going to talk about how we think that if we can make a law, it's going to make everything better. So first of all, let's uh, talk about people saying that sin is a good thing. Uh, let's look in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 25. And I'm going to give you just a minute there to, to get there. Somebody told me from the last time, said, slow down just a little bit. Give us time to hunt things up. And I will gladly ab oblige on that because hardly ever does anybody tell me to slow down. Hebrews 11, 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God that to enjoy than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. We can't say sin's not pleasurable. If it wasn't pleasurable, we wouldn't want to do it, would we? But I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of focus on two things, and we can apply this to a lot of sins in the world. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about alcoholism and drugs. And I know we look at what we see people tell us about alcohol and drugs. And uh, they say, well, that's what everybody does. That's what you're supposed to you get, you get out. Uh, you go to the lake. That's what everybody's supposed to do. Get out and drink. Uh, you know, you go to a ball game. That's what everybody does. You're supposed to drink. Uh, they also tell us... <clears throat> that it makes you say intelligent things. If you can imagine that, they, 
Only intelligent people drink. Uh, we're also told that it makes you cool. It makes you act cool, walk cool, be cool. They also tell us that it makes you more attractive. Let's look at Proverbs, the 23rd chapter, verses 30 through 35. Proverbs 23, 30 through 35. Here's what God is saying. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go and seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, and then when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake, and I will seek it yet again? So the world has told us a great big lie, but this is what God tells it. It don't make you pretty, it don't make you smart, and it don't make you cool. This is the truth about alcohol. Let's also look at 1 Thessalonians, the third chapter, verses 3 through 4. 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 through 4. <clears throat> that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. Some people say they drank to make the pain go away. Just make, make the hurt go away. I get up in the morning and I'm depressed and I need that drink or I need that drug. But we all have tribulations, don't we? And a lot of times we won't say, well, your tribulation's not as bad as mine. I have to have that drink. But the Bible tells us we're all supposed to suffer these tribulations. We can't know if our, our troubles is as bad as the other person, but we all have to deal with that. And God has given us ways to, to deal with these things. So here's some of the things that the world has not told us about alcohol and these sins and so on. It doesn't tell us that everybody started with that one drink. And there's people out in the world today that's going to tell you, well, a little bit's not bad. A lot's bad for you, but a little bit's not going to hurt. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. But everybody started with that first drink. Or that first pill. Or whatever. Uh, it damages our immune system. It might give us heart issues. It causes nausea and vomiting. The world's not going to tell you about that part or having to clean up somebody that's vomited and to keep them from strangling on their own vomit. Liver failure, seizures and strokes, brain damage, social problems, loss of employment, damaged relationships, incarceration, financial troubles, homelessness, risky sexual behavior, and life-altering consequences. These things can change your life forever. Now, I have an uncle that one night he thought he was going to partake of this pleasure, and he ran over two children. He altered the life of that family. You can't bring those children back. It altered his life because that he had to spend some time in prison. 
but it did alter, it can alter your life forever. Let's look at Mark, the seventh chapter, verses 20 through 23. Mark 7, 20 through 23. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within and defile the man. We can't say that alcohol or drugs or anything that somebody has made us do that. We chose to do that. But I said I was gonna come back to the a little bits all right. I want you to look through that list. Look through that list and I want you to find which one of those sins God says, a little bit's all right, but a lot's not all right. So it don't, it don't work with none of these sins. It doesn't work with alcohol. Now you may say, well, Paul told Timothy to take a little bit. You know, but he's not going to contradict what he said here in Proverbs. So that must tell us there's two different kinds, or at least two different kinds of wine. Because God's not going to tell us in one place to do the right thing and then another place to do the wrong thing. But that's a story for another day. We don't have to... So we can't say that we're forced into these things. We choose it for ourselves. Next, I want to talk about another big lie. What we think is beautiful. What we think is beautiful. And, you know, a lot of us, we want to be... You know, we want to be pretty. We want to be beautiful. Uh, so what we don't see a lot of times when we look at these pictures on the magazines and see things on the TV screen, we don't see that those things has been doctored, that nobody looks that perfect. You know, they put the makeup on, they put the lipstick on, uh, they make the cameras, make it look just right at that moment in time. They pin their clothes up and they make everything perfect. They don't tell you these things. Uh, Meghan Markle, she's listed as one of the 10 women that's probably not pretty enough to be in Hollywood, if you believe that. But she says that one day she would be criticized for be, not being thin enough, not being pretty enough, not being ethnic, ethnic enough, and then the next day, They'd say, oh, you're too thin, you're too ethnic, you're too pretty. So we see it's fleeting, it's constantly changing. Men and boys is the same way. They think they're going to look like the guys on TV that has the ripped muscles and, and they're going to look just like them. Uh, here's five reasons you're not going to look like any of those pictures or any of those people in Hollywood. Number one, they're richer than you are. You can't afford to look like they do. They've got the money to do it. They can buy the trainers. They can get the Botox. They can get their cells all fixed up. You're not rich enough to do that. Um, you aren't as motivated as they are. You have other things to do with your life. You can't spend your whole life just looking pretty. They can, because that's their job. Um, professional lighting, fake tans, like we said before. They can fix you up to look pretty, but we don't have that around us all the time. Uh, some of those people may be taking drugs. We talked about the ripped muscles. They may be taking drugs that's gonna alter their body and eventually kill them one day. So you may, you may not or don't want to do those things. And then, also, you don't know them. They may be a hateful person. They may be uh, somebody you don't want to be, but you just don't know them. Another thing that I want to talk about 
on, in this slide is that somehow the world has presented that if you are half dressed, you're prettier. And we see that in the schools. We see young girls that are half dressed and even young boys now. And when they're walking down the street, we see them. And even when we go into Walmart, turn around and look around, and we see somebody that they think that makes them look pretty. Now you're going to say, Donald Brady doesn't know much about beauty. He's an old man, he don't know much about beauty. But I'm here to tell you that I married beautiful. If you look in the dictionary under the word beautiful, you'll see Donna Brady's picture. Now, I'm sorry, sorry to all you other women and the actresses and the models out there, but second place ain't that bad. <laughs> but you know, me and Donna, both of us, gravity has sort of taken over. And, and sort of the, what used to be up here sort of come down to here. And we got a few more wrinkles and things like that. But Donna is more beautiful today than she was the day I married her. And here's why. Let's go to 1 Peter, the third chapter, verses 1 through 6. Likewise, ye wives... Be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of the plaiting of the hair, or the wearing of gold, or of the putting on of apparel. But let it be the inward man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So you're going to say, Donald Brady has an agenda here. He thinks that wives should obey their husbands. Why do we feel like we have to apologize for that today? This is not what I said. This is what uh, Peter said as an inspired person from what God wanted him to say, that that's a beautiful thing when wives are that devoted to their husbands. Now, your hu the husbands, you don't get out of it. Because the Bible also tells us that the husband needs to love his wife even as Christ loved the church and was willing to die for it. Let's not minimize that. You should be so devoted to your wife that you're willing to die for her. So that's some devotion. That is a beautiful thing. But that's not the thing that the world says is beautiful. Let's go, and we have to talk about Proverbs 31. So let's go to Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 17. Proverbs 31, 10 through 17. Who can, and I'm not going to read uh, the whole thing. There's a lot said in this, but I'm just going to read through verse 17 and then verse 31. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax, and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like a merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar, she rises while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth the vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. And then verse 31. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her works, let her works, Praise her in the gates. 
that's what makes her beautiful. So here's some of the things that I get from this. A virtuous woman takes care of her family. She's valued. Her husband values her. Her children value her. She doesn't give up. She's a worker. And her accomplishments are what give her praise. These are what these verses are telling us. So also, a lot of times we see that men think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. That's another big lie. Let's go to Proverbs, the seventh chapter, verses 8 through 27. Before you think that the grass is greener on the other side, let's see what the description uh, that the proverb writer is telling us here. Proverbs 7, 8 through 27. Passing through the street near her corner, and he went, her way, he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, and with the linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh alloys and cinnamon. Come let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. For the good man of the house is not home. He's gone on a long journey. He had taken his bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much first speech she caused him to yield. And with flattering of her lips, she forced him. And he goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, and as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver, and as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thy heart decline unto her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, and goeth down to the chambers of death. So this is the true description of whether the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. That we see that there's only trouble on the other side of the fence. I once heard it said that you can't destroy a good marriage. And I truly believe that, that that's true that we realize that, you know, when I think of all the work that I've had to put into my marriage, you know, there's no way that you would think that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. All right, the third lie I want to tell you about is that people think material things are going to make us happy. A promise was made to Solomon, and I'm not going to read, read I had this all written down, but if you want to, to go to 1 Kings, the third chapter, and read through five through nine that the promise that God made to Solomon. And if you think about it, if you're the king of Israel, you bow got it all to start with, don't you? You're a leader of a powerful nation, and you got all these riches that David has built up. But God said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna promise you, Solomon, I'm gonna, you know, whatever you want. And so, you know, Solomon didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for the material things. He didn't ask for the life of his enemies. Uh, but God said, I'm going to give that to you anyway. But I'm going to give you all, uh, I'm going to uh, give you what you want. He asked for wisdom. And really, if we got lots of riches, it's a good thing that Solomon had wisdom too. Because we see so many people that they win the lottery, and then what do they do? They kill themselves, or they blow it, or they waste it. 
and we see that they didn't have the wisdom that came with it. It's a good thing that God, that he did get wisdom with uh, all those riches. Here's some things that money's not going to buy for you. Uh, and we, we think that happiness is just that one item away. It, it, that, that one more thing, if I could have that, then, you know, I'm going to be happy. Um, if, you know, um, if I get that one more thing that I don't have that's going to make my life easier and so on, I'm going to be happy. But that's, that's the illusion. Uh, it won't fix relationships. So you can't say, well, I'm having trouble with somebody. I'm going to just throw a little money at it, and then that's going to make everything better. It doesn't fix that. You know, only, only your communication with them is going to do that. It can't buy you peace. It's not going to make you, and I think that's what a lot of us are looking for is just peace. But, but money's not going to buy that for you. So here's the conclusion of what uh, Solomon figured out. You know, he had the wisdom. He had the riches, he had the power, he had the life of his enemies, he didn't have to worry about none of that. But Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, probably a lot of you can quote this from memory. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandment, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And then, the one you've been waiting for, uh, legislation is going to make everything better. This is another big lie. You know, we think if we just make that one more law, that's going to fix everything. Uh, and we see a lot of that going on in the world today. That we think, you know, if we can just get that one more law, that's going to be, that's going to make everything better. Let's go to 2 Peter, the first chapter, and verses 3 through 4. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are the, uh, given unto us great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God has given us everything that we need. Another law is not going to, not going to fix those things. Here's why another law is not going to fix our problems. If we created 10 million laws, people are going to find 10 million ways to get around those laws. Um... We've added laws since the inception of the Constitution. Let's think about this. All these laws that we've added since the institution of Constitution, has it decreased violence in the world today? Has it lowered teen pregnancy? Has it lowered the crimes of theft and larceny? Has it made people treat one another better? It's done none of those things. We cannot create a law that is going to do that for us. So there has to be a basis for answering to a higher power. You know, a knowledgement of God was part of our Constitution. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. At one time, we acknowledge God. And uh, we still need to do that today. Because, let's go to Job, the 12th chapter, verses 23 through 25. Job 12, 23 through 25. He increases the nations and destroyeth them. He enlargeth the nation and straighteneth them again. He taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. They grope in the dark without light, and he maketh them stagger like a drunken man. So, whether we acknowledge God or not, he's still in charge. 
and I can take a lot of solace in that. You know, he's letting us play games with our governments. And he said, there's always going to be wars and rumors of wars, and there's always going to be people that they're wanting to acquire new territory, and there's always going to be division uh, between the people, and there's always going to be people that are trying to hurt one another. But remember that God is still in charge, and he always has been. And, you know, we can always go back to Job and see that that, that is true. Uh, we can't make a law uh, that, you know, people don't commit a crime and say, oh, I better watch, I'm going to get caught. You know, we can't make a law because those people think that if they disobey that law, they're not going to get caught. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 through 7. So you are all children of light. And the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, they're drunken in the night. People do this in the night, and, you know, we can use the analogy here is they think they're not going to get caught. So we can't make a law that, you know, because people think that they're going to get caught in this law and they're going to have to pay the consequences. A lot of people that commit crimes, now the ones that don't commit crimes, they may obey those laws because they're not worried about getting caught. But we can't make a law because there's always going to be people that think, I'm not going to get caught. And there's always going to be people that will be willing to pay the ultimate cost. And I'm not going to read about... Uh, Samson here, but Samson's a good example of that. Uh, you know, the, the, the government thought of the Philistines, they thought, well, we got Samson here, we're going to punish him, uh, and we got him under our thumb, we're going to take care of him once and for all. But if somebody's willing to take their life, how can you make a law against that? The law means nothing to them. They say, I'm, they're not going to get me, I'm going to take my life, or put myself in a position where somebody else is going to take my life. We can't make a law against that. There's going to be people that does that. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, the big lie begins with us. There's not going to be that magic pill out there that's going to make all the hurt go away. We're going to have to find some way to deal with those hurts, but that magic pill that magic drink, that's not going to make that pain go away. We can chase a certain look uh, that people say is beautiful, but that's really not, not beautiful. Uh, we can do, we can try to be beautiful the way that God tells us to be beautiful. Uh, we try to move more and more to find that one thing that's going to make us happy. And you're going to keep chasing that uh, if you do that, is to find that one thing I can buy or find that one salary adjustment that's going to make everything better. But, you know, we're going to just keep hunting. And we, uh, when nothing else works and we say we're going to make a law to fix everything, that's not going to work either. So here's what Jesus is saying. Amongst all these lies... John 14 and verse 6. John 14 and verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's the only way to get to the truth because he is the very essence of truth. If we want to know the truth, that's where we're going to go. Pilate didn't understand that. Let's go to John 18 and verse 37. John 18, verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered and said, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth his voice. 
Pilate didn't understand that. He said in verse 38, And Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. So he didn't really know what the truth was. He didn't know what truth was. But he didn't know that Jesus didn't have any fault in him. So, you know, a lot of people out out there are going to say, I know Jesus is the truth. I believe that. And, you know, I might even confess that, that I do believe that Jesus is truth and he is the Son of God. And, and to be willing to change their life. But a lot of people are out there that tell you, that's all I need to do to become a Christian. But I want to, something sometimes we forget about. And I do want us to turn to this and look at it. Let's go to Matthew 3, verses 13 through 16. And then come Jesus from Galilee and, and to Jordan, to Jordan and to John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so for now, for thus becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, uh, uh, was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. If baptism is not important, why did Jesus do it? Jesus was truth. He didn't need the remission of sins. You know, he didn't have to be baptized. If we say baptism not really necessary, that's just sort of, you know, an act that we do. But if it was not that important, why did Jesus do it? And why did God come down and to say, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. And, and then on top of that, for the Holy Spirit to come and descend upon him, that's saying to me that Jesus thought that baptism very important. God thought baptism very important. The Holy Spirit teaches us that baptism is important and that we're going to have to do that before we become Christians. Finally, let's look at Ephesians 5. Verses 8 through 9. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children in the light, for the Spirit of uh, the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So after we become a Christian, God wants us to walk as children of light. Not in darkness, not in lies, but He wants us to walk in truth and to bear fruit. What do you mean bear fruit? You mean God doesn't want me to sit there and look pretty? God doesn't want me to just sit there and go make money? No, God wants you to bear fruit. If you feel subject to the invitation, ask that you come as together we stand inside.